Hello and welcome to today's Office Hours call. This is Paul Hoyt. Um, our Office Hours presentation is a relaxed, informal mentoring program that I do every Monday at noon Pacific time. This recording is going to be available online for a few days, and then all recordings are archived in the members area. This is Office Hours number 37. The reason I do this is because I know that being a successful small business owner can be a great experience, but I also know it's tough. You really need the training and the mentoring in order to make your success as comfortable as possible. I also want you to get to know me, because when you get to know me, you'll know that I care, and I really do want you to succeed in your business. The agenda for our office hours presentations are that we have an in-depth discussion of a business success principle. I offer some closing remarks, usually some special offers and an invitation for the following session, and then we have open questions and answers. And because some of you might not be around for the end of the call, I want to make sure that you know that we are off next week. So this is Monday, June the 16th when we are recording this. There will be no office hours presentation on Monday the 23rd. We'll be returning again on Monday, June the 30th, two weeks from today. And you'll be able to share some information about what we'll be talking about about at the end of the call. But today's call is on what are you biting off, your business complexity profile. As always, I talk about the key performance areas of business. In fact, last office hours presentation was all about the key performance areas of business and why I have this diagram in the particular way that I do. If you missed last Monday's office hours, I encourage you to listen to the recording because we talked about each one of the key performance areas and which ones were most important at which stage of growth in your company. But this office hours pr presentation is on business complexity profiles and it's squarely focused on the key performance area of leadership. As a leader of your company, as a small business owner, as an entrepreneur, it's your responsibility to understand what your complexity factors are. We're going to talk about that today. In our agenda, we're going to talk in general about a business complexity profile and why that's important to, why that's important to you and give you a couple of really good examples of those. And we'll talk about business complexity factors. We're going to go through each one of the key performance areas and talk about what aspects of those areas make, make one business a little more complex or more difficult than other areas, than other businesses are. And then we're going to sum it all up and talk about the bottom line. So first concept here is that businesses are a lot different. We all know that entrepreneurs are not the same, that they vary in their experience and their talent and their work ethic. We're just not the same, not you and I or anybody else who has a business. But as it turns out, businesses are not the same either, that they vary in complexity that each business has its own business complexity profile and its business complexity score. I've analyzed hundreds of businesses and I came up with this graph called, which demonstrates the business complexity profiles for 13 or 14 different businesses. These 14 different businesses range from a very simple business of selling roses by the street corner to the most complex business that I've had a chance to work with, which is a new medical device business. These businesses are not anywhere close to the same. As you can see, their total scores range from a 9 to a 52, and that's 52 out of a potential 70 possible points, so or really 63 possible points, because I don't give anybody a score higher than 9. So uh, with some of them, it is extremely easy to have a business, as you'll see from the Selling Roses example, that the only one that gets a higher than a 1 in their business complexity score is the area of sales, because this is a little bit challenging when you're selling roses by the street corner to have a good line and a good impulse sale. You have to walk up to people and be a little bit assertive. But that's the only thing complex about that business at all, and it's not nearly as complex as many businesses are in the area of sales. Down to the bottom business, which is a medical device company, which no score is later is is any less than a six, and they're mostly sevens, eights, and nines. It's because that is an extremely critical business with heavy government regulations, heavily funding requirements, heavy product development requirements, heavy legal requirements. Literally everything about a medical device business is complex from the very top to the to the very bottom. We're going to take a little bit of, a little bit more in depth look at a business here for the next couple of minutes. And the one that we're going to take a look at 
is a hot dog stand. A hot dog stand has an overall complexity score, a complexity profile score of a 13. When the area of leadership with regards to running your hot dog stand, self-motivation is essential, but you have no employees, so you don't have the complexity of hiring and manage employees or motivating those folks. The location is everything. From a marketing perspective, the location of your hot dog stand is by far the most important thing. If you nail a great location where there's not a lot of other street vendors around and a lot of traffic and it's around lunchtime or dinner time, then you can do pretty well with a hot dog stand. The marketing is not complex at all unless you have a lot of direct competition. But generally, people try to set up their hot dog stand where there's not a lot of direct competition. From a sales point of view, it's very simple. It's impulse sales. Hey, you look a little hungry to me. Hey, how would you like to have a hot dog with sauerkraut on it today? Things like that that you can say to attract people's attentions and encourage them to purchase a hot dog from you. It's a very simple service, just a little banter. It's a cash business. You, don't, you may or may not use credit cards. Most hot dog stand purveyors don't run credit cards, although it's easily done these days with iPads and, and smartphones that can take credit cards, but generally it's a cash business and there's very little inventory and little inventory shrinkage. You do have to manage your inventory a little bit, but generally speaking it's not that hard to after a month or so of running a hot dog stand to figure out how many hot dogs you need to have on board, how many you have in warmed and heated up at any one time so you can limit your shrinkage, etc. So it has a business complexity profile of 13. It's a simple business. Almost anybody who loves hot dogs and loves people and has good worth ethic can have a hot dog stand and have a successful business at that. Here's another business I want to talk about which is a simple consumer product which surprisingly to most people is one of the more complex businesses. In fact, in my whole business complexity profile chart there were only a couple of them out of the 14 that were more complex than a simple consumer product. It's one of the most complex businesses that there are because there's typically long and expensive product development cycles. There are oftentimes legal and patent issues that you need to take care of. There's oftentimes a very heavy marketing expense. Most people are surprised to know that it can cost you fifty or sixty thousand dollars to properly package your consumer product so that you can sell it on the shelves at your favorite retail store. It just ta takes a lot of money to do that. Typically there's complex supplier relationships, so a lot of consumers these days look towards Asia or foreign countries in general to get their products made, which would make for very complex supplier relationships. I know people that have jumped on planes and you know headed to China you know, at the drop of a hat because of, they, because of issues that they had with their suppliers over there. It's generally a capital intensive business, which means it takes a lot of money. $250,000, $500,000 is almost a minimum for somebody to think about bringing a consumer product to market in any size or shape because of the expense of product development, because of the expense of managing your supplier relationships, because of the expense of raising capital in the first place and the marketing expenses. It, it's a very capital intensive product. And the worst thing at all is that there's unknown market response. You generally don't know how the market is going to respond to your idea, to your consumer product, until you make a bunch of them and get them out in the marketplace and see who buys it, see which dogs will actually eat the dog food. So that makes it a lot more complex than, the, than a simple hot dog stand that we talked about earlier. Much of what I know about business complexity and the, what I'm going to talk about here over the next few minutes comes from one of my favorite books called Investing in Entrepreneurs. Investing in Entrepreneurs with the subtitle A Strategic Approach for Strengthening Your Regional and Community Economy was written by Greg Lichtenstein and Tom Lyons, both PhDs from the Horton School of Business. For over 25 years, for nearly 30 years now, they have been studying the art and science of improving the success rates of entrepreneurs through multi-million dollar grants all over the country. So these folks are some of the brightest people that I've ever met when it comes to helping increase the success rate of small businesses. And essentially the message of the book is shown in this graph. What it says is that if you take rookies and, and give them a very simple business, they can be very successful. 
If you take a rookie and give them a massively complex business, they are not nearly as likely to be successful. And likewise, if you take a very seasoned and experienced entrepreneur and ask them to run a very simple business, they're not likely to be very successful for very long because they're going to get bored. It's not going to suit you know, their mental requirements. It's not going to suit their self-esteem or their self-image requirements. It's just not going to work for, very well for them. So you want to match up the, the mindset, the skill set, and the experience of the business owner with the complexity of the business. And to do that, it takes understanding what the complexity profile is all about, which is why we're having this presentation today. We talked a little bit last week about how many business owners take the job of being a business owner without even knowing what the job is. For most people, when they first set out in the business, they think that the job is this light green stuff. In other words, they think the job is doing what they love to do most of the time, and then they recognize that there's you know, some of this other stuff, too, that they got to pay attention to. But I'm going to be a coach because I love to coach. I'm going to be a painter because I love to paint. I'm going to be a roofer because I love to do roofs, and I'm really, really good at it. And they, they go into work thinking that the job is what they love to do, when the job is really something like this, that they only get to do the things that they love to do 30 or 40 percent of the time. And the rest of the time is being spent on doing the things that they really don't love to do and things which may be very complex for them. Here's how this turns out for most people. Here's an example. By the way, these examples came from my course, uh, the Business Survival Boot Camp. Um, we're going to run over my Lynn and then I'm going to give you a lot more in-depth information. With this example, we're going to take a simple coaching business because I know lots of coaches out there. Most coaches are surprised to learn that coaching is only 30 to 40 percent of the business. They have differentiation challenges in the marketplace, and the selling or they are selling a service with largely intangible outcomes, which makes sales a little more complex. They oftentimes have sensitive client relationships, which makes service a little more complex. And my general understanding of a coach's business complexity profile looks something like this just a little bit in terms of leadership. Even if they're a single person, you have to show up for every call at your very, very best and exhibit great leadership capabilities whenever you are a coach because essentially you're coaching other people to be better self-leaders and leaders of their company. It is a tremendous marketing challenge to differentiate yourself from other coaches. It's a sales challenge because you're selling a largely intangible a product or service. Um, financial management operations and product development can be very simple and service can be complex too because like I said you have to show up at every coaching call with your A game because it's your, it is not just your knowledge and it's not just the questions, it's not just your experience that helps your clients, is that you are modeling the very energy that they are looking for. So you have to show up in a leadership format and, a, and in a and from a perspective of customer service, every single call that you have. This is the coaching business, fairly complex in three areas, product of, uh, sales, marketing, and customer service. I want to take a typical new coach. This one is an example of an actual lady that I knew. Her name was Nancy. She was a nurse. She was a good leader because she was a shift supervisor. She had no marketing, no sales, no financial management experience at all. She was very, very good in operations. Because when you're a nurse dispensing medications, you have to be good at operations. You have operational checklists, and you can't deviate a second from those, not one little bit, because it could really, I mean, you could actually kill somebody by giving them an overdose of the wrong medication, for example. So you have to be very good in operations, and Nancy was extremely good in operations. She had no capability in product development, but she was really good at customer service. She was a high-touch nurturing, friendly, compassionate, you know, devoted to her patients kind of nurse. But she was she really didn't like the the job of nurse after doing it for 14 years and she decided to be a coach, knowing that it was her tenderness and her compassion and her nurturing that would help her be a good coach. Well, when you take Nancy's capabilities and line them up next 
to the requirements of being a coach, you see the significant gaps. She's got no gaps at all when it comes to the area of customer service because she's been taking care of people for a long time. Only she, she just has to learn a slightly different style of communication and she will be able to take care of people as a coach. But she has these tremendous major gaps in the area of marketing and sales. Her very success of her business depends on her learning success in marketing and sales and closing just some a little bit of gap in the area of financial management and a little bit of gap in the area of product development. But generally speaking, this is her job. Those are the complexity factors for her business and what she needs to focus on in order to be a successful coach. In Nancy's particular case, she went to a business growth conference where they encouraged her not just to be a coach, but to run a coaching empire. Nancy, you are so skilled, they said. You've been a nurse for 14 years. You're extremely sharp. You're very capable. We don't think that you should just be a coach. We think that you should have your own coaching business. You should develop your own style of coaching, and you should hire other people and let them coach for you, and you focus on running the coaching business much like you focused on running your shift when you were a supervisor at the hospital. So here's what happens when that happens, if she considers doing this. It means that her complexity score jumps from a 29 to a 50 because she has a lot more leadership challenges, she has more marketing challenges, more sales challenges because now she's selling other people and, and she's competing with people in a way that she hasn't competed before. There's financial management challenges, there's operational challenges, she has product development challenges now because instead of just being a coach, she's developing her own co coaching system and she's going to have to jump in and have more customer service challenges too. So where she had two small gaps before, now she has two extremely large gaps and two gaps which are also very large in the area of financial management and product development. And she's created a much more complex business for herself. And this is a perfect example about why knowing your complexity profile and knowing your capabilities is very important so you can discover these gaps. As it turns out, every single key performance area of business has their own complexity factors that we're going to talk about here in a little bit. But first I want to answer the question of what is a complexity factor? A complexity factor is anything about your business that requires a very special skill set. It may be something that requires years of education or even years of experience on the job in order for you to do a good job. They are things that take a lot of time that you have to focus a lot of time and energy on it becomes a complexity factor for you. Um, things that cost a lot of money that consume a lot of your available startup capital or a lot of your working capital is, is a complexity factor or can be a complexity factor for you. Things that are tough emotionally. Sometimes we work in environments where there's a lot of high anxiety on behalf of our clients and that can be a complexity factor because that can suck the energy out of you too. And generally things that carry a lot of risk. If you're making life and death products, for example, that's a complexity factor. We're going to go through each one of the key performance areas. I'm going to give you some examples of complexity factors in each one of these areas. So you might want to pick out a, a pencil and a, or, and a piece of paper and make some notes for yourself as we go through. First, let's talk about leadership. Leadership complexity factors can be things like layers of management. If you only have, if you're a soloist in your business, there's no layer of management complexity. But if you're running a business with 500 people that has four or five or six layers of management, that's a much more complex business. If you're dealing with unions that are very complex rules and regulations and complex negotiations every few years when you have a union contract, that can be a complexity factor. If you're working with the government or the government has a lot of regulations and influence over your business, that makes the business more complex. The size of your company in general makes the business more complex. And your overall performance of your company, whether you're performing well or whether you're facing explosive growth or whether you're facing a downturn in the marketplace or you're really you know, underwater from a cash flow perspective, that can add a lot of complexity to the area of leadership. And finally, the stage of growth can add complexity as well because 
companies that are in either startup mode or turnaround mode are are a lot more complex than companies that are stable and either growing steadily or just having some layer of financial stability. In the area of marketing, things that can make your company more, more complex are competitive pressures. Some of us live in a red ocean where the, where the water is filled with the blood of carnivores, which is the analogy from the blue ocean strategy. We'd like to have a blue ocean where there are very few competitors or practically no competitors, but most of us have severe competitive pressures. Uh, the Nancy, when she goes to be a coach, is going to have severe competitive pressures because there are a lot of coaches out there. If you're working in a rapidly changing industry, that means that your marketing has to change and your product development has to change uh, frequently, much more frequently than companies that operate in stable industries. If you're, in, if you're working with life and death products, you have to be very cautious from a marketing standpoint about what claims that you make to make sure that you don't run afoul of the Food and Drug Administration or any other sort of regulatory industries. Whenever you're entering new markets, that adds complexity to your marketing because you have to figure out exactly what level of marketing and what messages of marketing, what media associated with the marketing is going to allow you to enter that new market successfully. And speaking of marketing, if you're doing e-marketing, which means you're relying on social media marketing or, or you're doing information products, for example, uh, that can be very complex because it is so rapidly changing, very, very rapidly changing. And last thing is if you're dealing with very challenging markets. Some, some markets are necessarily more challenging than others. So, for example, if you have a healthcare business and you're dealing with people you know, have, who have been injured or people who are you know, emotionally upset, a counseling business of some sort, if you're dealing with people who are challenged with their business, whether they're in startup mode or bankruptcy mode, there are some markets that are much more challenging than other markets, some products that are much more challenging, and that can add to the complexity of your marketing area as well. In sales, some things that add complexity to the business are the length of a sales cycle. Very short impulse sales is much less complex than sales cycles that are 18 months long and involve a committee of people. The number of transactions that you do in generally, the, the more transactions that you do, the more complex your sales operations will be. Some sales departments have very complex compensation plans. Some of them have channel programs and channel partners where they're working with other companies to help, to help sell their products and services. And sometimes if their scope of operations is not just local or regional, if they're going national or going global, that can really increase the complexity of the sales process as well, or the sale area as well. In financial management, things that can increase the complexity are cash flow implications. Um, some people have steady cash flow, you know, a moderate number of transactions, dependable every single day so they can count on their cash flow. Other businesses have very large transactions, and so their cash flow can vary considerably from month to month. One month they might have $100,000 in cash come their way, and the next two or three months they might not have any at all. So, so there are some businesses that are more complex from a cash flow point of view. Some businesses have complex credit terms and installment pay payments. Now, generally, you want a moderate number of medium-sized transactions. If you have a massive number of small transactions or a very small number of massive transactions, that can inflect, influence the complexity of your business. The size of your company, just like with leadership, can generally increase the complexity in the financial area. And my, one of my favorites is if you are raising capital. If you're choosing to raise capital for your business, that can add a tremendous amount of complexity to your business because there's a tremendous amount to learn, a lot of mindset issues that you're likely to have to overcome or deal with, and it will add a lot of complexity to your business. In the operations area, the, number of, the size of the inventory and the number of pieces that you have in inventory can add to your complexity. The product complexity itself adds complexity from an operations point of view. Some people have very simple products. Other companies sell products that are very complex. They're very expensive. They have lots of levels in their bills of material, lots of components that go into their product, which makes their business more operationally complex. The number of locations that you are supporting. 
whether you're operating from a single virtual office or a single office location, but if you, it, it can, it's very simple. But if you're operating from multiple locations across the nation or around the world, that can really add to the complexity of your business. And what sort of legal compliance issues you need to deal with? For most of us, it's a simple business license, and if we're selling products, then we have to pay our sales taxes. But for companies that are dealing with medical products or um, or have in other ways some very complex legal issues, if we're raising capital, for example, that can add to their operational complexity. Some companies have very simple information systems, you know, QuickBooks and a couple of PCs in their set, and other ones need very complex systems like, company, like companies that are actually manufacturing products need multi material requirements planning systems or complex manufacturing and inventory systems. And then if your company is dealing with any ecological or toxic product issues, that can add a lot of complexity from an operations point of view too. From a product development point of view, anytime that you're dealing with rapidly changing technology, that can add to the complexity of product development. You have to focus a lot of R&D time on just making sure you understand what trends are happening in, with the technology in your particular marketplace so that you can keep up with it and hopefully stay a step ahead of it as well. And again, like with operational areas, product complexity means a lot. You have to invest a lot more on our research and development if you have a complex product with lots of levels in their bill of material, lots of components. Design cycles add to the complexity. Some companies can create new, say, information products or coaching products in a matter of days or a matter of weeks. Some companies it takes them years in order to design and roll out products. Um, then design cycles are continually being compressed. It used to be that the automobile industry took four years from the time that they started working on a car to the time that it actually hit the streets and now it's down to about two years. So their design cycles are continually being compressed. And the research and development investment that you need to make can make product development a lot more complex. The last area is customer service. We talked a little bit before about the anxiety of the customer base, but some of us deal with clients that are going through some tough times in their lives, whether that be emotional issues because we're counselors or coaches, or if they're going through a tough time because their business is struggling, if you're a business consultant, or if they're going through a tough time because they've got you know, medical challenges to face, if you run a business that deals with people who are facing medical challenges, Anytime that you have an anx high anxiety in your customer base, you've got more complexity in your customer service area of business. Some, cu some customers or some businesses run highly complex products that have it, and it, a lot of quality issues to them. And if you've got a lot of quality issues, then that means you need to up your game in customer service. If you've got a lot of customers, that means that you're typically going to have more customer service issues. As I've said before on some of these calls, a very good rule of thumb is that one or two people out of a hundred out there is a little bit crazy and a little bit more of them out of a hundred are having a tough time right now. They're going through a bad moment. So whenever you increase the number of customers, the likelihood that you're going to run across somebody who's having a really tough time or somebody that's just, you know, litigious and crazy are increased quite a bit. So customer service will have to increase. And as I mentioned several times, the product complexity generally means that you have more quality issues and more customer service issues, that you have to train your customer service staff a tremendous amount. So here's the bottom line. As we went through those areas pretty quickly, I know, I help people develop their business complexity profile about as a, as a service of what I do. So I understand that we went through it very, very quickly. But here's the bottom line for you. Every business has their own unique set of complexity factors. That my business is not the same as your business, is not the same as other people's business who are on this call or listening to the recording. Every business has their own unique set of complexity, fac complexity factors and understanding them is essential to enabling the growth of the business. Once you understand your complexity factors, you have the opportunity to turn those complexity factors into your success factors. Because being good at what is tough with your particular business in your particular industry is key to your success. If you can recognize what your complexity factors are 
and focus time and attention on those, then you can create your own great solutions by understanding your challenges. Then you can create your own extreme competence, your genius around the tough areas of your business, and you're going to thrive. So that was our agenda for today. We talked about business complexity profiles and why it's important for you to understand the business complexity profile for your business. We went through each one of the key performance areas and we talked about business complexity factors in each one of those key performance areas. And then we summed it up with our bottom line. So here's your homework and your exercise. I want you to think about which areas in your business need the most attention and which areas in your business give you uh, the highest complexity. And as always, this slide presentation will be up and available. You can click on it and download the presentation and go through those complexity profiles or complexity factors for yourself. And then focus your energy on developing processes to manage that complexity and developing your own success criteria around the complexity issues with your business. And of course, if you need help or support in any way, I strongly recommend that you get a CEO coach. We're going to have open questions and answers in just a minute. First of all, comments and questions on the topic of the day and then any, any others you might have. And then I want you to tell me what your biggest takeaways are and what insights that you gain from this presentation. Um, and tell me what you're going to focus on over the next few weeks as well. So as you know, most of, most of you know that I am a business consultant and a CEO coach. I just love being a CEO coach because I'm very passionate about getting you the support that you need to make amazing progress in the next 90 days and provide the fundamental training that you need as a business owner to avoid the huge mistakes that are going to slow you down or shut you down over, over time. I want you to call right now, if you would, uh, for a free 30-minute problem-solving session. In each one of these free problem-solving sessions that we're going to have, we're going to check in with your particular status on your business. I want you to pick one particular issue that you're dealing with, and we're going to work on it on the call, and then we're going to explore ways that we might want to work together later on after that. As I mentioned earlier, um, our next Office Hours presentation will be in a couple of weeks. We're skipping a week. The next one will be on June the 30th. I think I'm going to talk about um, business foundation profile, but who knows, I might change that in the next couple of weeks. I want you to let me know which of topics that you may want me to address by going to paulssurvey.com and do your homework in between now and the next session. We're going to open it up now for questions or comments on the topic of the day and then any other issues that you might want to talk about. As always, you can go to paulssurvey.com, give me an email to paul at paulhoyt.com or send me a text or give me a call at 415-997-8001. Or you can go to SchedulePaul.com right now to schedule your free 30-minute strategy session so that we can have a check-in about your particular business. And with that, we're going to open it up to uh, any questions that we may see out there. Sometimes we get questions emailed in ahead of time. Today, I don't know that we had any ahead of time. So if you have any questions about business complexity factors and business complexity profiles, uh, please type them into the chat box or otherwise raise your hand in some particular way. Uh, and I would enjoy hearing that question. And i also open it up for a couple of uh, lovely ladies that I have on the call with me today, Marcel and Stephanie, who are we assisting me with those questions and offering me some of those questions as well. Sometimes I get the question of what is the most complex business that you can imagine. Uh, and as I've seen, as you saw on the earlier slide, the biggest one that I've actually had an opportunity to work with was a new medical device company. And it was very complex because of the legal issues around the medical device. It was going to take them five to seven years to get that product to market. I mean, they were looking at many millions of dollars in R&D expenses before they brought that product to market and lots of different hoops that they needed to jump from, jump through from a legal basis in order to get their medical device in market. But it wasn't the most complex business that I know about. I do believe that hospitals are probably the most complex business out there um, because of the tremendous regulatory requirements they have. It is a life and death business. Um, they, I, they are dealing with, with challenges every single day. And so I think, generally speaking, 
a hospital is an, is one of the most complex businesses that there are. Very large, you know, billion dollar corporations that are making things like jet airplanes and are making not quite automobiles because I think airplanes are a lot more complex with that. So Boeing or Lockheed Martin or McDonnell Douglas, I think, are very, very, very complex businesses, ones that I wouldn't even dream of thinking that I had an opportunity to, you know, to be a senior official at. So no matter who you are, no matter how long you've been in business, there's going to be businesses out there that are so complex that it's just not right for you to be in a senior executive role with that business at all. Um, um, Marcella or Stephanie, I'm going to invite you to, to ask a question if you like or to share any questions that might have come through on the backside. Any questions out there from Marcel or Stephanie? Well, it helps if I unmute myself. Yep, this is Stephanie. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for, for talking about the most complex because that was one of my questions. Um, another question I have is, what examples have you seen of companies that stay on top? I, you know, there's a few examples of companies out there that stayed on top for a long, long time. Microsoft is not, you know, is not well respected by many circles because they have a very highly competitive environment, and they were in the early days of Microsoft, you know, ruthless competitors. Um, but, but I have a respect for the company itself. You know, they went out and they, they saw a window of opportunity in the mic in the marketplace. They jumped through that window of opportunity. They carved out a very strong competitive position, and they maintained that competitive position for a long, long time. They started in like 1981 with the PC DOS that came out was a Microsoft product. So they've been around now for 33 years and done a really good job. In the high tech world, other companies that I have respect for are companies like Apple and Hewlett Packard and Oracle companies that I've known about since I began my career in information systems a long, long time ago. IBM is another one that's, that's extremely well respected in that particular industry. So there are good companies out there that are well respected for their, um, for their acumen. And, and other companies that are foreign companies, Sony, um, companies like Sony and Fujitsu, Samsung, are companies that are national, international companies that I've got a lot of respect for. They have managed their complexity extremely well and managed to stay at the front of an industry that's very rapidly changing. So I've got a lot of respect for those types of companies. I also have, by the way, the same amount of respect, as it turns out, for a young coach, a young coach who gets started in the coaching business and who recognized, like, like the example I said earlier of Nancy, who was a great uh, nurse, a second shift supervisor at a hospital, and decided to be a coach. And in our conversations, recognized that she needed to go out and get assistance with marketing and sales. So she signed up for, for programs that not only taught her to be a good coach, but taught her about the business of being a coach. And they taught her about marketing. They taught her about sales. And so she's successful because she was able to, to um, develop expertise and competency in the other areas of business and stay ahead of the game. And I'll pat myself on the back a little bit here for managing to be in business now for 13 years as a business consultant. Along the way, I've had to learn a tremendous amount about dealing in a, what I consider to be a fairly challenging marketplace. Small business owners, those who are just starting up, those who are attempting to to leverage their dream and jump out into business oftentimes don't know what they're doing at all. They jump into business and take the job of being a business owner without knowing what the job is. So it's been uh, quite a journey for me to develop a wide variety of products and services that were just right for small business owners where they could get tremendous support for just a few hundred or a few thousand dollars to start off with their business that, and to become a person who was more interested in their long-term success than I was, you know, how much money I could get them to spend with me. One of the challenges that they have in the marketplace is there's a lot of people out there that are more than happy to take their very last dime to sell them you know, an inspiration program or a marketing program or some other program without consideration for, for the rest of the business at all. Um, so 
you know, that's what makes my business complex is I'm dealing with a challenging marketplace with a lot of com competition out there. So differentiation in the marketplace, developing products in the marketplace, sales skills, all of those things, just like with coaches, were challenging for my business as well. But after being in business now for 13 years, um, I think I'm managing them reasonably well. Any other uh, questions or comments, Stephanie or Marcel? Yep. Uh, here's one. What is the best way to rapidly increase product development in a red ocean? Wow. That's an excellent question. So again, a red ocean is one where there's a tremendous competition out there. Um, and that people are, you know, companies are falling off, you know, day by day because they're not keeping pace with technology or other people are, are uh, you know, out marketing it in some way. And I think that's the two things. Number one is you really got to keep pace with technology. You have to be members of trade associations. You have to be online every single day. You have to have your finger on the pulse of the industry to try to know exactly where the industry is today. And not only that, but where the industry is going tomorrow. So keeping pace with technology is one of the most critical success factors of any business that's dealing with a red ocean. Um, because any little thing that you can do in advance of or ahead of or before your competitors gives you a competitive advantage. So that's what you're looking for in a red ocean is any little competitive advantage that you can strike out and claim for yourself. And I think the second issue is marketing. Because in a red ocean, you have to generally have very sophisticated marketing campaigns. And that means spending a lot of marketing dollars in order to get yourself noticed. You have to be out there. You have to be doing daily stuff and weekly stuff and books and tapes and all kinds of things because it's all about marketing that gets you noticed. The more times that you can get your name out in front of somebody in a way that reflects very positively on your business and on your expertise, the better marketing that you're going to have out there. Testimonials, case studies, frequent communications with your prospect base, with your client base, with your referral base are very critical whenever you're in a red ocean. So those two things, any little thing that you can do to give yourself a competitive advantage and then invest heavily and be very sophisticated in the area of marketing, I think are the two most important ways to keep yourself to keep yourself ahead of the game and address the complexity whenever you're dealing with a red ocean. Any other questions? Yep. yep. Uh, here's one that just came in. Okay. I thought of a new invention when I woke up this morning and I don't have the financial means to proceed in development. What could I do? I think the first thing to do is to write it down and do a uh, do what I call a concept test. And, and if you can go back and listen to the office hours presentations that I did on Nail It, Then Scale It, and the one previous that I did on the Lean Startup methodology, which I think was office hours number 17, and get well, well versed with the Lean Startup methodology, you'll see that you can make progress in your business without spending a lot of money. So if you have no money at all to spend on the product development, then the first thing to do is to describe it and go out and talk to your customer base and learn as much as you can from your customers without even building a prototype. So we go out, the general rule of thumb is we want to talk to 100 people who we think might be customers and just describe the product for them. An example I often use is, is the one that came across from, uh, from General Mills that said that if we were to create a product, that we sold for $4.95 and, and when coupled with a pound of hamburger would make a meal for a family of four, would you be interested in that product? And of course, they're describing the product Hamburger Helper and when they did their concept tests, they got a lot of people to say, yeah, that sounds pretty cool. I'd like to be able to just take a pound of hamburger and combine it with a little something and feed a family of four. That would be great. So. You can do the concept test as well. Describe your product and service, what it is, generally what you think it might cost, what the value is to your client whenever they have the service or whenever they purchase the product, and then go talk to your customer base and you'll learn a lot. And then find a way to create your prototype. Find a way to spend $5, $10, $100, whatever it takes, $500, 
to create your prototype and then go back to the people that you talked to earlier and go back to new people and say, you know, here's the prototype. What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? What would you like to see me add to it? What would you like to see me leave out of it? What guidance can you give me to make this product fit your needs and wants more than it does today? So you can do a lot with concept tests and very simple prototypes without having to spend, you know, $100,000. I remember early in my career, I, one of the very first people that I talked to about being a prospect for the business was a, gen, was a gentleman who had spent $100,000 and had purchased 10,000 widgets from China. And he tried to get them to sell, and he just couldn't sell them. He invested literally his, his life savings and the life savings, I think, of some other members of his family, creating a product that the marketplace did not want. And I don't hate to see that happen to anybody. So anybody listening to this call, that's what we want to avoid. We want to make sure before you get into any sort of heavy investment that you know exactly what the product will, who the product will sell to, who your market is, how much they'll pay for it, what they really like about it, how they want to hear you talk about it, how they want to be sold the product, et cetera. So that's what I strongly recommend. Apply, study the lean startup methodology principles and apply it so that you can get as much feedback from the marketplace as possible before spending a lot of money in developing your product or service. Any other questions out there today? Should you document the names in a thumbs up or down uh, for that list of those 100? Yeah, I would. I would ask people uh, for their names and email addresses so that I could contact them for the next phase of market research or when the product is available. Um, so you know, I'd, I'd ask them right up, up front. So I'd love to get your name and telephone number and email address so that I can send you some more information on this product as the product is developed and so we can continue to get your feedback. And, and also, of course, we off, offer special discounts to those who helped us out with our market research in advance of creating and launching the product. So absolutely, anybody that you talk to, unless they just, you know, say, go away, I don't even want to talk to you anymore, and you'll, you'll meet some people like that, but most people are friendly, will give you their email address or in their name and maybe even their phone number too so you can follow up with them. So yes, by all means do that. Always be creating your list, one of the fundamental things of marketing. Get the name and contact information for everybody that you run across and ask them for permission to put you on their put them on your mailing list so that you can stay in contact with them. You never know when their needs or wants might change. You never know when you may, they might run into somebody that could gain a tremendous amount of value from your products and services, and you want to have top of mind awareness whenever that happens. And the way that you create and keep top of mind awareness is through reaching out and touching your marketplace you know, very frequently. I do it on a daily basis and on a weekly basis as well. Any other questions out there today? Um, you know, we were talking about the Red Ocean before, mm -hmm. and a question came in. Is there a differentiation self-audit list of questions? Can you ask that, a, a self-audit list of questions for differentiation? Can you ask Correct. that? It's, I'm, I'm having difficulty understanding what that question was. Can you explain that in a little different way? Um, we were talking about the Red Ocean and uh -huh. about, the about the different ways of, uh, of differentiating yourself, how to know if you're different, how to know how, you know, to identify the differentiations, to, to identify those differences. I, I think it's really about ob objective market research. So it's asking your marketplace, you know, which ones of these you know, features or benefits or value statements are most appealing to them. You may think that you're different in some way, but if everybody, you know, everybody is thinking they're different in the same way, then nobody's different because we're all the same. I don't know if I can yeah. repeat that or not, but it sounded pretty good. Um, so, the, so the deal is that you want to ask your market. And I talked earlier about objective market research. One of the things that's challenging from a marketing perspective is that you almost can't do your own market research very effectively because people are, you know, we're, we're all, we're a, a society of generally of encouragers and supporters. If you walk to, up to somebody and say, don't you like my new product? 
isn't this really cool? And you come across with this friendly puppy dog kind of attitude. Um, very few of them will look you in the eye and say, you know, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I think your product sucks. They're just not going to do that. They're going to say, oh, yeah, that's great. Congratulations. You're a nice guy. Give you a pat on the back and let you go forward. So I often, I think it's one of the, the success principles in the Beyond Business Survival Training Program is that we do objective, independent, third-party market research um, at least once a year, getting people to call into our customer base and really asking them objectively what they find to be most appealing and what they find to be most disturbing about what they really like, about what they don't really like, what they consider are our key differentiators to be because sometimes it's tough to tell for ourselves because we oftentimes don't really know what our competitors are sharing in their websites and in their marketing materials and in their communication because we're not receiving it ourselves so it's only when it's only for those people who are receiving that information for themselves that can give you that fair and objective response and it's usually only through third parties that you get that objective response any other questions for us today, Marcel or Stephanie? Um, if someone's weak with product development and packaging, then you don't really know how different you are, huh? <laughs> yeah, I think that that's, that's an excellent comment. As, as I have said on a more than one office hours presentation, um, the, um, you know, the challenge with inventors, musicians, and artists of all kinds is generally we go to our garage and we we uh, create our product and then we go out and try to find a market to sell it to. That we're, our focus, and I understand what it's like to have a calling and understand that you have a book that just has to be written and get it out of you, because I do that myself. But I also try to listen to the marketplace and understand what they need and want. So sometimes I create products that I had to create because it was my need or my desire to create the product. And other times we create products that we know that the marketplace wants. And when there's a, a, a happy union in between those, it can be a wonderful day. If, in fact, the marketplace really wants exactly what you have to offer, then that's a wonderful, wonderful thing for your business. So it's hard to tell, you know, when we're creating things that, that we need to create because we're creating them really for ourselves, that's a lot different than going out and starting with the marketplace and understanding what the marketplace really needs and wants what the marketplace is willing to pay for that, how they want it packaged and delivered to them, and then create a, a product that very specifically meets a known need in the marketplace because then you can be very successful. And that, by the way, is the very definition of a market-driven biz business versus what I talked about before for a product-driven business. Any other questions for us today? We're at 12.57, so I think I'm going to call it a day right then, not seeing any other questions that are coming in. Um, I want to remind you of my offer for a free strategy session. Pick up the phone and give me a call or go to schedulepaul.com and find a place in your calendar that works well for me. Again, as a re or, and works for you too, excuse me. And as a reminder, there'll be no office hours presentation a week from today. We'll we come back again on Monday, June the 30th. Uh, and the subject of that presentation is to be determined, but it's likely to be on your business foundation profile. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks for listening to the recording. And until we meet again, this is Paul Hoyt wishing you a most marvelous and prosperous day. Bye-bye.